Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Today is my pleasure to introduce uh, Chris White. Chris is a uh, Flatiron postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Computational Astrophysics. He did his PhD at Princeton. He's worked as a postdoc at uh, now Berkeley, Princeton, uh, CCA, uh, and he's a uh, wealth of information on GR, MHD, and radiation. Uh, he's played a, a huge role in developing the Athena++ code, so I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Chris, please take it away. So yeah, today I just want to talk about a few aspects of, I think, what are kind of interesting frontiers in the story of black hole accretion these days. Uh, so just uh, to outline, I'll start off to get everyone on the same page. You know, what are the basics you need to know about black hole accretion and the simulations that we do? Um, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Chris. Um, I, I forgot to have you join the Zoom here. Ah, so uh, not. I think it was in the email that, uh, that we sent out, so if you could just join and then share your screen. Uh, that one, yeah, there we go. So okay. Uh, and if you could just share share your yeah, screen. Share yeah. screen. Yeah, there you go. Share everything. Does that look good on Zoom? Seeing some thumbs ups from, from you, can, you can minimize that. Yes. Bar in there. That's uh, you gotta that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, he's oh, oh. Uh, then I don't know how we get rid of this for the little bit more. Uh, yeah. Minimize. Yeah, there you go. High. There two high floating meaning controls. There you go. Awesome. There we go. Great. Okay. So yeah, today I'll talk about just kind of three aspects I think I find interesting in black hole accretion. So I'll start off just with some of the basics of you know get everyone up to speed on what I'm talking about, and then I'll do a little bit. I'll talk about uh, just the methods and the theory we have, and in particular an emphasis on you know what are the dark secrets in this field, what doesn't quite work yet, and then the three topics I want to talk about. Um, one is this idea of tilted disks, where stuff is coming in misaligned with a spinning black hole. Um, another thing is I want to focus on the galactic center because there's lots of interesting data coming from that as well. Um, and then I'll go into kind of where I'm thinking of what's the most interesting in the next few years, which is this radiatively efficient accretion and the sort of numerical methods we're applying to that. So, you know, black holes come in a wide variety of sizes all across the universe, right? So from a few, a few solar masses up to supermassive black holes. And okay, other than the one on the left, all of these are kind of actual images. So M87 in the top right, and then um, you know we have uh, SS433, I believe, in the middle right. So that's a stellar mass black hole. So what do we we see? A very interesting emission because there's a very hot accretion disk close to the black hole that's emitting at high energy, and a lot of black holes have these jets that can propagate for long distances away from the black hole, and that's one of the ways we can detect it, even outside the galaxy that's hosting it. Um, so you know, they're, they're great to study because they're powerful sources that we can see far away and we get lots of data for, but they're also very complicated. Um, so what goes into black hole accretion? The black hole itself is actually very simple. Right? Black holes have only two parameters, you know, their mass, which I've said, 10 to a billion solar masses or thereabouts, um, and a spin parameter, which is a dimensionless number, and you can go up to one for a maximally spinning black hole. And that's really all general relativity gives you. Um, of course, though, we don't directly really see any black holes. We see the matter that's close to the black hole. And the matter is where things get complicated. So right off the bat, uh, we'll have a plasma, right? It's going to be very hot because it's fallen very far into a potential well. But that plasma is not necessarily collisional. So it could be uh, the mean free path is very long, and so you have to deal with plasma kinetics. There's other parameters that dictate how these systems behave. You have the accretion rate. 
uh, relative to the Eddington rate, you have whether the disk is geometrically thick, like in this cartoon I've drawn, or the scale height is about the same as the radius, or geometrically thin. You also have the optical thickness. You know, how can radiation actually escape from the disk, or is it trapped in there? Um, we also talk about the magnetic field strength and the topology. So here I've just drawn, you might have small scale turbulent magnetic field loops embedded in a disk, and the disk itself might be, you know, ions and electrons moving around. Um, but you might have an ordered magnetic field, for instance. And this is the sort of thing that want, is pretty conducive to launching powerful jets. Um, and then, of course, if you add radiation, you worry about how strong is radiation relative to gas pressure. So there's all these parameters, and they're not independent. Um, but it's why there's a rich variety of you know, the parameter space of accretion is very wide, and there's all sorts of different phenomenology there. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a lot about numerical simulations. The reason for this is that these disks of accreting matter are highly turbulent, right? So uh, the Reynolds numbers are astronomical, and so there's only, you know, you can do a lot with pencil and paper, but you can't do everything. Whenever we have these turbulent systems, numerical simulations are a powerful tool for studying them. Um, now, if we're studying the accretion of a plasma near a black hole with numerics, uh, the equations can get kind of messy, but conceptually they're not that bad because they're the same as you know, Newtonian hydrodynamics. We have a conservation of mass, which I've just written here using you know, covariant divergences of, of relativistic quantities, um, but it's still just conservation of mass, conservation of energy and momentum, uh, and an induction equation because this is a uh, highly ionized plasma, so there's kind of ideal NHDs of pretty good approximation. Um, and then we just close everything with an equation of state, and for everything I'm going to talk about today, the equation of state is the simplest one possible, it's just a gamma law. Um, and that's pretty good, we could talk, you know, afterward about where that might not be the most appropriate, or what changes if you change this a little bit. Um, but I think that's, it's not, that's not the worst assumption we've made by far. Um, and to study this, uh, the code, the workhorse code that I use is Athena++, and there are a number of codes out there that can do very similar things. So this is a finite volume MHD code. I should say that Athena, by the way, is 95% of its use is not this. It's used for ISM and star formation and protoplanetary disks, and there's no black holes in sight. But I use it for black hole stuff um, because it works just fine on a curved space time. It also has you know spherical coordinates. It has adaptive mesh refinement. We can do fun things like you know putting things on spherical grids and having it uh, resolve them. Uh, we do more than just fun with the simulation, though. We, we actually do real science with it as well. And it's designed to run you know, on your laptop or on you know, the largest clusters we can find. It's also publicly available. So by the way, you know, everything I do with Athena is part of the publicly available branch. There's no secret you know, ingredients here that like, only I have access to. So if you want, you can download the code and try this yourself. Your trick's just getting enough computer time for some of these things. Um, now, when you run 3D large-scale simulations, there's a question of what do you do with all this data? Um, so it turns out reducing it and making sense of the science is not trivial. It's also something you have to work into your, your whole project. And for a lot of what I do, I've actually found I needed uh, ray tracing code compatible with this data. So the idea for a ray tracer is you put a virtual camera in your simulation, and you shoot rays back from the camera through the data, and then you say, how would this form an image? Um, and the reason you need custom software for this as well as the off-the-shelf ray tracers is if you want to have a black hole there, you want your light rays that will bend through space-time as they would because of general relativity. Um, so I wrote this code called Blacklight, and again, there's other options available. And this is the sort of thing, primarily it looks at you know, synchrotron emission for making uh, event horizon telescope images. And you can take your simulation, make mock images compared to the data, but it also offers all sorts of other ways to visualize the data, whether you can you do these 3D volume renderings of this is density and highly magnetized jet, or you count how many times the GLS crosses a certain plane, so you get kind of these caustic patterns in the midplane, or the kind of broadband images of black holes. And so again, this is publicly available software, and um, and this has all sorts of different modes. And I find it's very useful to have a lot of tools for analysis at your disposal, because otherwise you're just stuck with you know, terabytes of simulation output, and you don't know what to do with that. So what sorts of uh, What's the state of the theory here? Um, you know, it's, it's all well and good to say I can take the equations that govern the fluid and I can just simulate a system and see what it looks like. Um, but there's a few subtleties there. One is that the light that observers actually see might be coming from unmodeled processes. So uh, a lot of what I talk about is low luminosity AGN, you know, the galactic center. So we have this millimeter synchrotron emission, right? And synchrotron is just, right, it's a relativistic electron corkscrewing around a magnetic field, fine. Um, but 
the state of the electrons and their temperatures and how thermal they are, it does not enter into mine or pretty much anyone else's simulations um, because it doesn't feed back on the, the fluid in bulk. And so there's this question of, you know, we did this nice simulation, but we still have to invent stuff along the way to compare to observations. Um, there might be non-ideal effects that are uh, like viscosity or resistivity. Um, those are particularly nasty in relativity because you want to make sure um, the naive way of implementing these things in equations is not Lorentz invariant, and that's not something you should be doing in a general relativistic setting. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, maybe our system isn't even a fluid at all, so maybe you know, using a fluid code is fundamentally a, the wrong thing to do. And the point I'll talk about most today is that just about everyone, maybe 90 to 95% of simulations, assume that everything in the, in the system is aligned. What I mean is you have a spinning black hole, you have the angular momentum of falling gas, and now it's all pointing in the same direction, uh, which nature is not always so kind to do. Um, but anyway, despite all of these caveats, I think it's important to point out that to zeroth order, everything really does work. It's actually remarkable we can take these, you know, from first principle simulations of gas falling into the galactic center, uh, and we can get we can put on some reasonable synchrotron assumptions, we can actually get images that look like what the EHT sees. So that's actually just a remarkable success in and of itself. But you know, that's been the past few years, and now we're moving past, okay, things just work. Now we kind of ask detailed questions about what's happening in these systems. And that's where I'm going with all of this. So going back to that kind of last assumption, you know, everyone likes to make things aligned, and I like to make things not aligned because uh, nature tends to do this. So my, I'm talking about tilted disks, and the idea is take a spinning black hole. So we're looking edge on on this diagram. I'll try to keep all the black hole spins will be vertical as much as possible in all my figures. Um, and you know, colloquially, we say that space-time is being dragged in the direction of spin. You can write this, you can be more quantitative, of course, but it really means it's very hard for particles to orbit anything other than prograde around that uh, black hole when it's spinning very fast. However, Gas accreting onto a lot of black holes doesn't, doesn't know about the spin. If you think about you know, the supermassive black holes at centers of galaxies, the gas is coming from parsecs away. It really has no notion of what spin it's going to encounter when it gets down there. So it very well could be coming in with its own angular momentum. Um, fair enough. And then the question is, what happens in the center, right? The gas would prefer to be oriented in one direction, in this disk. The black hole would very much prefer to be oriented in a different direction. And that's where interesting dynamics happens. Um, this is the result of, you could think of it as a spinning black hole torques fluid elements, but that torque has a very strong radial dependence. You have this differential torque uh, on the fluid. And of course, I'm simulating fluids, or I think I'm simulating fluids, uh, not say dark matter. And so it interacts with itself. And so you have these pressure forces that can communicate between adjacent fluid elements. And so the, the overall question I've been asking for a number of years now is, you know, what interesting dynamics happens here? What observable consequences does that have? Um, just to give an example, here's an edge-on view of two simulations where, again, the black hole spin is vertical, and I just try to keep everything the same as much as possible, but on the left, I've aligned the gas um, with the spin of the black hole, and on the right, I've tilted it by something like uh, 20 degrees. And if I play these movies, so this is log density, so on the left, we have kind of this turbulent flow, um, stuff is just flowing into the black hole, but um, you know, it's, each frame is kind of noisy, but the statistical picture you get is all very constant. You never get much gas above or below the black hole. There's this evacuated corona and so on. And this is what most people simulate. If you tilt things, also you get very interesting effects, right? This disk gets its very interesting shape. It's actually hard to show in 2D, in this 2D slice, because it's, you can imagine it's warping and twisting in and out of the plane. So depending on how you slice it, you see different parts of it. Um, you, also, you also get this effect where what used to be a very nice low density, region above and below the black hole, separate from the disk, is now getting filled in with all this kind of junk. And that's not just numerical noise, that's actually real, but because of the dynamics of what's happening in here, you can actually eject material out here, and that'll show up later as having an observable effect. So tilted disks are interesting, and I'd argue that many times in nature, it, this will be the case. And so we can't just limit ourselves to thinking about aligned systems as easy as, you know, and appealing as that might be. So, Right, everyone's familiar with over the past five or so years, there's been a lot of talk about the Event Horizon Telescope and it's had all these wonderful results. Um, and one question I'd like to ask, kind of you know, working not with inside the EHT collaboration but adjacent to it, is can these images tell us anything about the tilt of the accretion flow? 
Or do we, even, do we require tilt to explain images like the one on the right? Um, I think that'd be a really interesting question to ask. And so one of the things I did was I, let's, I said, let's take a first stab at this. Let's just say, you know, all else being equal, let's try to model M87, the first data we got, um, using both an aligned and a tilted disk, and just say, to first order, what are the differences? And kind of a summary from that investigation is here I have five snapshots of an aligned simulation and five snapshots from a tilted simulation. And in these cases, I've, I ran the simulation, I then did ray tracing, I modeled the synchrotron emission, and then uh, blurred it to match kind of the effective resolution of the data we have up here. And you can see the aligned simulation, you know, at different times it's slightly different, but you always get this kind of crescent shape in this roughly circular pattern. It, kind of matches the data. In the tilted case, there's two big differences. One, you don't get quite such circular patterns. The ring and also the hole in the middle of the ring can get more elliptical, and you get kind of this patchier, blotchier uh, effect. And that's just because now there's different parts of the disk. It's not so clear what parts of the disk are Doppler boosted towards you because it's tilted and warped in different ways. Um, so the idea is, you know, this is the sort of thing that can distinguish between aligned and tilted disks. And it's really important to know because other things can masquerade as, have, um, as tilts, or tilt can masquerade as other things. So for instance, if you read papers on modified theories of gravity and how they would impact uh, EHT observations, one of the big things a lot of them have is they would make this disk eccentric. Um, and I'd just like to point out that maybe, you know, GR can be perfectly correct and you just have a misaligned accretion flow can also have the same effect. So if you're looking for deviations, you need to know you know all the things that can affect your image. Yeah. So I got a question. You didn't just the moons didn't show any jets flying, but M87 does have a jet. The jet could interact with the disk. Yes. And that's not in this, I presume. Um, that's not in this that I will show later on. Yes, I'll have some tilted things with jets as well. Yes, so this movie I showed before was actually a sane simulation, so there was no strong coherent magnetic field, so there's not a strong jet. But you're right, M87 probably has a strong field because it has a very strong jet that we see. But yeah, so it can interact as well. Um, but before I get to that, I'll just I'll just explain. I think it's worthwhile saying not just we ran a massive simulation. Here's you know some some pretty pictures, but kind of diving into the data. You know, we have all this data. It's worth it to take some time and say what what did we learn from all this? Um, and here, as an explanation for why we get these weird um, these distortions in the shape, uh, there's been known since kind of. The few people who have been investigating uh, tilted disks, especially starting with Christopher Geel back in, uh, I guess, 2007 or so, um, you tend to get this pair of standing shocks in the accretion disk. It's something along roughly the line of nodes where the disk intersects the midplane of the black hole. Um, if you want you know, real details, it's, it's a clustering of the apoapsides of like eccentric fluid element orbits, but we won't go into uh, that much detail. But you can see this. Um, these shocks can actually dominate the energy and angular momentum budgets of the accretion flow, so I can kind of really determine everything that's happening. And so here, if I look down the spin axis of the black hole on the left, and I just make a projection of column density of electrons in the simulation, um, so you see there's this two-armed feature, right? It's not because I sliced through the midplane of a tilted thing. This is a real projection, and there's actually just more electrons along some line of sight. So you'd expect more synchrotron emission. And indeed, if I then say, you know, what synchrotron emission would come from this model system, I get this kind of two-armed feature from a tilted disk simulation that I wouldn't get from an aligned simulation. Um, I should point out, the two, the middle and left images, I've turned off gravity as far as it alters um, the rays of light, so that's just to help figure out, you know, where things are. If you then turn on gravity again, you get the strong lensing effect, the middle image turns into the right, and this is, you know, what I've an infinite resolution EHC image of my simulation might look like. So now you do get this you know, photon ring, of course, but you still have this remnant two-arm spiral. And that's the sort of thing that if you then blur it, you get kind of this patchier, eccentric um, ring on the sky, and that's the sort of thing you could look for in EHT data. Uh, so there's a question about jets. So yes, of course, black holes, especially if there's a strong magnetic field nearby, you're great at launching jets that propagate for very long distances. Um, so here, I'm showing three simulations and aligned, and then I think tilted by 30 and 60 degrees. Um, so blue, I'm tracing the uh, density of the material, and red is uh, actually sigma greater than one, so it's highly magnetized material, and it's a good tracer for the jet. 
And in the aligned case, of course, you know, the jet goes along the spin axis of the black hole, which coincides with the angular momentum axis of the disk. As you tilt things, um, disks, and I'm not the only person to note this, disks tend to try to redirect the jets eventually, the black hole will try to launch it along the spin axis, but the disk will try to divert it to match the disk axis. Um, here, these are also not ter terribly strongly magnetized disks, and so they're somewhat weak jets, and so the jet is redirected, but you can see it kind of gets interrupted, and you get this very non-steady jet behavior in this, these cases. Um, what the colors do here? I mean, how are you defining red and blue? Uh, red, red, blue? Yeah, so it's just two colors, and they become more intense the more column they go through with that material. So blue is just above a threshold in density, and red is as it's passing through any highly magnetized region. Um, but I can do the same sim set of simulations here with, these are mad disks, so magnetically arrested disks. Basically, I have strong, coherent magnetic fields down near the black hole horizon for a variety of tilts. And so here, these make much stronger, um, the short movie there, say that again. Uh, these make much stronger jets, but they're still redirected by the disk in this case. I think, you know, when you have a thick disk, and remember I said disks can be thick or thin, these are all thick disk cases. It's very hard for the disk to not redirect the jet, um, just because you know, there's so much mass in the disk and so little in the jet. Um, so I think I would say, and this is this study is not yet completed. You know, redirection of the jet is for by thick disks is I think pretty robust. It's just if you have a weak jet, you might actually kind of choke it off entirely. I mean, I didn't show if you had a 90 degree tilt, then it really it's hard for the jet to get out at all, um, and so on. So yeah, tilted disks have a, a variety of effects, um, and so a number of them are observable, and I think that's what makes them interesting, because you can really ask, you know, a tilted disk only exists because black holes have non-zero spin, so we're actually probing, you know, the spin of this thing, and, you know, the spin in general relativity is it's this purely general relativistic phenomenon, right, to the fact that we're dragging space-time around, so I think it's really interesting when we can see direct signs that point to a black hole must be spinning. All right, so... Enough for the moment of just broad theory. I want to focus on a particular black hole, uh, the Sagittarius A star in the center of the galaxy. Um, so this is a lot of work I've done with uh, Sean and also Lena Merchikova. Um, and the idea is, okay, we have from independent measurements, we know very well the mass of the black hole, at the center of the galaxy. And now the Event Horizon Telescope has taken and is continuing to take data of it. So here's you know, the first image they released of the galactic center. Again, it's this kind of you know, donut in the standard orange color scheme that we all plot our black hole data in, right? And what do we know? We know that it's a very low accretion rate relative to edit you know, less than one part in a million. So we expect a geometrically thick, optically thin disk. Um, we also know that this is nearly collisionless, which is a little bit scary. The mean free path for a particle around the galactic center is about the, si the system size. So it makes you think um, it's not at all clear that we should be treating this as a fluid. Um, but there are studies um, that people have done that show that surprisingly treating it as a fluid works well. I can go into that later after the talk if you want. Um, we also know a lot about this in terms of the gas supply. So we know there's a large reservoir of gas around the galaxy, in, around the center of the galaxy. We also have counted you know, a few dozen wolf ray stars down the center. <laughs> the winds coming off of those stars is more than sufficient to supply all of the mass in the plasma that's getting down to the horizon of the black hole. So we don't even need to invoke extra sources of mass. We know, you know where it can all be coming from. And that's not true of you know, any other supermassive black hole in the universe. So we do know a lot about this. It's a great system to model. We, don't, we haven't pinned down the spin of the black hole, exactly what it's magnetic, the magnetic field the plasma is doing, or even you know, how well-defined a disk it, it has, I would argue. So, I want, one thing that comes when you have all this data, you can start really testing your models and seeing if your models hold up. And one issue that's come up in the past year or so, and I think if you ask you know, the EHT theorists, I'd say at least half of them would say this is a, a big problem. Um, there's a variability issue in that a lot of the models the EHT makes of black hole accretion look like the images they get, except if you ask, how variable are the light curves in the models versus how variable is the galactic center in millimeter? And we have lots of data on that over the years. Um, and you get the, the models that look right don't have the right variability. Um, so to show this off, here's from the EHC papers. They have this parameter space where the, the five columns are different spins. You have sane versus mad, basically weak versus strong magnetic fields, top and bottom. Uh, in 
angle, you have our viewing angle relative to the aligned disks that they're modeling. Because all of the modeling here in this paper was aligned. Um, and radially, you have different electron prescriptions. Because I said, you kind of have to invent something after the fact to turn your simulations into observables. Um, and they just color it by which of these models looks like the data, and green are the ones that pass. And here they look at kind of all of their constraints except variability, and they get, you know, some models work. Great. They then add in um, other constraints from other sources, you know, other wavelengths, for instance, not purely EHT data, and you start to eliminate things. In fact, there's only a narrow corner of parameter space that really works. And you might say optimistically, that's great. We know now the properties of the galactic center. But more pessimistically, you might say, well, as we continue to take data, uh, nothing might fit. And indeed, if you then fold in variability, which is left out of this analysis so far, on the top here is the same parameter space. And they say, which of their models has the correct variability to match the galactic center? And there is some of them work, but not the ones that look right. Um, and so in general, if the ones that look right are correct, the models, the simulations we have are too variable given the light curves that we actually observe in nature. So a number of solutions are being proposed about this, and there's a lot of investigations that we've done. Um, but Sean and Leda and I got together and said, well, let's throw our hat into the ring and say, you know, what might, what might be going on here? And this is actually a figure Sean made. Um, we took three simulations. This is an edge on view. On the left is a SANE weak magnetic field on the right, and the middle is a strong magnetic field. On the right is one of these simulations Sean has done where you actually just model the Wolf Ray stars and their stellar winds, um, track it all the way down to the horizon and get something, you know, realistic feeding conditions for the gas going down to the black hole, which is not some nicely aligned disk that we start off with in the, as in the other two cases. <laughs> and the colors here are just a proxy for what's emitting the millimeter light that we see. And you can kind of imagine these are just snapshots um, that if you have you know, spatially more variable stuff, the left and middle panels would turn into temporally more variable um, light curves. Whereas in the, middle, or in the right case, where we use kind of the proper feeding conditions, we actually get this smoother, um, this smoother light curve. Why is this? Yeah, so I think the best explanation we have so far is there's a lot of gas that's going down to small radii without just working its way there through an accretion disk. So it's less turbulent. Right, so yeah. the standard picture is stuff far away just has to very slowly migrate inward and it builds up turbulence the whole time. Right. Whereas here, you have these parcels of gas that are kind of just, they happen to have low angular momentum, so they flew straight down oh, to low. Right. Um, I'm not sure how to quantify that off the top of my head, but I mean, they don't smack into the black hole. They do circularize somewhere, but. Well, they, they look like Yes, um, and we're, we haven't finished investigating the magnetic field structures. But I think actually one point to make about this is remember I said there's more than enough gas in the Wolf Ray winds to supply the stuff going up because very little gas actually gets down to the horizon compared to what's in that system. Right. So it's shot and told us that it was like one star that does close. Right, and so you worry then if it's such a small fraction of the gas, it could be at the tail end of the angular momentum distributions. So you can get very low angular momentum stuff going in, and that so you can be dominated by kind of the tail end of whatever distribution is out there. Um, and the result though is, um, the, you know, our preliminary study we, we looked at the light curves from these models. So and we looked at pretty good the structure function of those light curves, just a way of quantifying you know how variable it is. So the data. Um, is in these circles, and then the solid lines are just uh, models like the ones in the left in the middle. They don't quite work. In some regions, this discrepancy is not working in this field. Um, if we look at the one on the right, especially this, this blue line is this model on the right, it turns out it lines up much better with the data. And so this is, we're not saying we figured out the galactic center in all its details, but it's just a very interesting um, observation that, you know, if you go from, instead of having a simple arrangement of this disk, if you decide to you know, feed the black hole with what we know is actually happening in the galactic center, uh, it turns out it matches the data even better. I'd say that's, in hindsight, that makes sense, but it was worth pointing out. So there's more that we're doing on this front. Uh, Sean has even more simulations that I've been ray tracing and uh, analyzing, and so I think we can say more about you know, what the stellar winds are doing and also what the electron thermodynamics are doing in these systems. So, so more to come. I'm wondering Chris's question again. So like, you have this wind coming up, but what for A-star, what do you do with the magnetic field in that thing? Yeah, so um, you can grill Sean on this as well. Oh, <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> so I think the idea is we don't 
we know a lot about Wolf Ray stars. We don't know what their magnetic fields are doing. Um, so you put in a prescription for, it's something simple because as, as you get far away from the star, it'll be a simple geometry that dominates. Um, the question was, how strong is it? So these two lines are actually the beta of the wind. Um, and so you can imagine if, it's, if you put a strong magnetic field source from each star, then that sort of dominates the problem. If you put something weak in, it's more like the hydrodynamics dominate. Sean um, explained this to us, but having forgotten, is the geometry of the field mainly in the stellar wind, mainly radial or toroidal? Or? Uh, I think it's toroidal. Um, it's what you sort of expect. Yeah. Of and the idea is we're neglecting whatever small scale features. Well, I'm asking questions. Yeah. It's also, I think, being realized relatively recently that there's a quiescent cold disk around Saturday star. Yes. How can that add to this whole picture? I mean, could, could there be some gas that's being sort of scraped off that and, or somehow leaking in and changing? The yeah, water? there could be. I think there's um, there's a graduate student, Sinan Solanki, who's been working, I know, with Lena and Sean. Um, he's now in Maryland, and he's been <laughs> asked this question, you know, putting in these stars, but then instead of zooming into the horizon, zooming out and taking that kind of a cold disk there and saying, can we? Can the stellar winds keep that gas out? Um, and I guess I don't know what the final answer is yet. Um, but I think the answer is, you know, it's worrying because there's so much gas there. You know, if that cold disk that we infer were to kind of accrete, we'd have a much higher accretion rate in the galactic center than we observe now. So it could be we're in a weird time, a hundred thousand years or a million years from now, it'll look very different. Or it could, right? Or maybe the stars are just keeping it out. That's, yeah. Because I thought, you know, there's some where it's just, it isn't that far out, like, kind of far out. Right? Yeah, that's, right, and, and once it's down that close, how do you keep it all out? Surely. Well, it's ionized, it's, it's not ionized, it's, you know, it's like catapultic variable that goes into these ions. Anyway, I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, but it, it's it's really interesting, and I think there's, that's the overarching question with the galactic energy, how much, you know, 10 to the 4 RG out is that, is it in steady state out there, or we just happen to be in some lucky time observing, right? And I think we don't have the full answer to that yet. Um, one other thing I'll talk about the galactic center. Um, there's been a lot of talk about flares recently. So in many wavelengths, but I'll focus on the infrared, about once a day, there's a bright flaring event from the galactic center. We've known about this for years. Um, I should just preface this by saying, if you say the word flare, that's a loaded term. Some people would argue, and they might well be correct, that it's just the tail end of a distribution of variability. There's no discrete flaring. But one way or another, there's bright, there's a, a significant brightening in the galactic center. And this really uh, picked up steam in 2018 with the gravity collaboration. So they have four infrared telescopes working as an interferometer, um, and they look at the galactic center, among other things. And while they can't make resolved images like BHT, they claim they can make very precise astrometric measurements where the centroid of light is coming from. And they said they looked during the flare, and the centroid of light moved on this kind of 100 micro arc second circle around the galactic center. And that's really interesting, because now you start thinking, oh, that was some sort of hot spot, simulating light, and it's orbiting. We're actually watching a thing orbiting the supermassive black hole in real time. Um, and it may well be, but of course, people started looking closer. And it, it's it's hard to make that work exactly because the orbital period for these radii doesn't quite match what it should be, and so on. Um, and then you know, there's questions of inclination effects, lensing by the black hole. Um, but a lot of people start proposing things like you know, there's magnetic flux eruptions. We expect, especially if this is a highly magnetized flow. Um, and I think Bart's worked a lot on this as well. And you can that. Could, very well explained things. And so there's a lot of work for theorists because this wasn't something we really predicted. This was more something you know, the observers saw first, and now we're going back and saying, okay, can we tweak our models to make sense of it? So the question I wanted to ask was, what about that, those tilted disks that I keep you know, pestering the community with? Do they do this any better? Um, and the answer is maybe, so maybe surprisingly. So I took two models I had for the galactic center, one that was aligned, you know, standard aligned accretion flow, one that was tilted by 24 degrees, I believe. And I said, where is the centroid of infrared light if I just assume, make reasonable assumptions for thermal electrons emitting synchrotron? In the aligned case, it bounces around randomly, but there's no pattern here to speak of. In the tilted case, it was bouncing around, bouncing around. At some point, it made this giant excursion 
of something like 50 microseconds, which is pretty close to what you know this one observation sort of looked like. Um, and then I looked at the light curve and said, at that time, when did I make that excursion? Um, these are hours indicated here. This is during a double peaked flaring event that happened in my simulation. This is the sort of thing that I only see in tilted simulations, not in aligned ones. Is this related to a flux eruption, Chris, or, or is it completely independent? I don't, so I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think it's really flux eruption. This is not a, a mad tilted disk. This is more, so my interpretation is this is an eruption of matter. When I showed much earlier, you know, those, that first movie, uh, sorry, where did I? In this, right, when you get these kind of bursts of gas that fill what used to be an evacuated coronal region, this gas is hot and it's not negligible in density. And this is really good at emitting, you know, therm even thermal electrons painted onto this are good at emitting infrared synchrotron light. So my impression is this is a dynamical thing more than a magnetic thing. Um, but do you know like think, the, the sigma, like in the emitting region, do you have a feeling for what sigma is? Uh, it is it is less than one. This happens even with a sigma cut of one cutting everything off. I don't know. Yeah, so there's this the secret that Bart very really well knows that you know a lot of times we don't trust our simulations when they're the most magnetized regions and so on. So we kind of don't let that influence our mock observations. Um, but this is, I think, being pretty safe and saying, you know, the emission here is not coming from any numerical weirdness. Um, but yeah, I want to, more, more of this needs to be done. I just want to say, you know, I'm not going to claim again that I've solved everything to do with the Black Center, but I just want to throw my hat in the ring here and say, you know, tilted disks do this. I wasn't even looking for this originally, and they just kind of naturally do this sort of thing. Um, so it's definitely something I think we should take into account further, especially as more people are modeling, um, you know, Wilder accretion flows with different Just orientations. Yeah. Background information. So the spin isn't known very well for the galactic center, but there are sort of limits, right? Or limits as in Well, is it you know it's not dead zero, or is that still allowed? Um, I don't know. Bart, do you think it's, it could be dead zero? What's the official stance on that? Dead zero. Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear the, the normal this, question this, very well. Can the spin of the black hole at the galactic center be zero, or has that been ruled out? Because I would say that I would still believe it could be close to zero. I, I don't. I don't think EHT. And this may be an unpopular opinion, but I don't think EHT really rules anything out because it's only based on a few, like uh, models that were, you know, like like you're showing here that initial conditions actually matter a lot. So, so I don't think EHT ruled anything out. Uh, spin exactly zero is maybe unlikely, but close to zero, I would believe it. Yeah. Right, and, and in GR, honestly, a spin less than 0.5 is very hard to tell. It doesn't no, exactly. do much. And, but you know, what do you need to get the... Well, first of all, you got to have a tilt. You need a spin right. of some magnitude. Some magnitude, yes. Yeah. And what are sort of the limits in your, from your simulations? Um, or have you explored that yet? I don't say... I don't know if I have good limits. I'd say, though, I'll just go back to spins of less than a half. They're not going to do much. So I've... I don't show it here. Yeah, they won't produce this wander, for example. Not really. And they also, they won't, the shocks, for instance, in the accretion flow won't dominate the energy and angular momentum and budget at that point. Like that. Right. So that's a prediction of your model. Saying something about the spin of the Yeah, line. so, if okay. You wanna, if I want it to be from tilted stuff, that way. yeah, I would lean toward it has to be relatively rapidly spinning. Yes, you can hold me to that. Um, disprove me in a few years when everyone comes back and says it's not spinning at all. Um, but yeah, so that's so those are kind of two aspects of the Galactic Center. And on the last remaining time, I just wanted to go to kind of a new direction, which is away from these you know, low luminosity, supermassive accreting sources. I'm talking about radiation. So so far everything's been non-radiative, but when you want to add you know, radiative physics to a hydro simulation, sometimes it's like ne radiation's negligible, like everything I've been talking about so far. Um, if it's optically thick like in, a, in this, we're actually inside a star, right? Radiation is trivial because it just modifies the equation of state. It's not a new thing. Um, if it's optically thin, like in some parts of the ISM, you can just, the only effect it has is it cools off the gas, but you don't have to track where the radiation went, left the system. Um, but the problem is there are black hole accreting systems where none of these apply. You might have, you know, strong radiation forces, parts of the disk are optically thin, parts of the flow are optically thick. Um, and you know, quasars and X-ray binaries, a lot of them do fall into this regime where you start worrying about radiation forces. Um, so really you need to be able to solve additional equations in addition to MHD to model these systems. Um, so this has been done 
there's a number of groups now that have entered into this field. And I think the two big things people do in GR um, are moment methods and Monte Carlo. So moment methods, the most common being M1, the idea is you involve four numbers, uh, energy and three components of momentum for the radiation field at every point in space. Um, and the idea is you make a closure, a closure argument and say, we can infer the higher moments from the lower moments. Um, it's a pretty standard thing. And this does work in a lot of systems. It does have a problem that makes us worried um, in the Athena group that I'm working with. Uh, is It's a limited, under, it can't really capture the full range of what uh, light can do. So if I, here, if I take one point in space, and I say, let's look at the sphere of angles around that point. And on the left, I've colored it all uniformly. This is an isotropic distribution of intensity. Light is going equally in all directions, fine. On the right is a delta function. And this is like a laser beam, right? All the light is going exactly in one direction at this point in space. And if you think about it, I have used three degrees of freedom already to describe this. There's an overall intensity. And I use two numbers to pick out the direction on this sphere that's of interest. So I only have one degree of freedom left in the M1 scheme to kind of parameterize how isotropic versus laser-like the light is. And this is actually what that parameterization looks like. Um, but M1 fundamentally cannot capture crossing beams of light. So if you're modeling a system with two bright things or two bright patches of a disk, for instance, the light's supposed to cross through itself, uh, this is something you worry kind of a failure mode for this scheme, um, despite how common it is. Of course, there's always Monte Carlo. Like, when in doubt, Monte Carlo can never really go wrong, right? You just put enough, like, photons into your simulation, have them obey the laws of physics, and they kind of have to converge to the right answer. Um, people have done this as well for black hole accretion. I'd say it's, it is correct, but it's potentially noisy. And you worry that, for instance, if you don't have enough photons, you might not just be close to the, instead of being close to the right solution, you might actually be very far from it. If you kind of accidentally knock a parcel of gas really hard, harder than you should have, and then the next time step you knock it back the other way, but that's still, you know, two punches from the left and the right is not the same as not punching it at all. Um, it's also very difficult to efficiently parallelize this. I mean, these are not insurmountable problems, but they're the problems nonetheless. So in the group I'm working with, this is, you know, Yan Fei-Chung and Shane Davis and Jim Stone and others, um, we decided we want to try a different method, if only to check the other methods, we can all kind of converge to the same answer and have independent checks of things. Um, and so we decided the MHC equations kind of lend themselves to finite volume or flux conservative form if you integrate these over a cell. I'll go into that after the talk. Um, what if you did that for the radiation as well? So if you add, so this was conservation of mass, energy, momentum, magnetic flux as before. Now we're going to add a new equation, which is this covariant divergence of nonsense and momentum space covariant divergence of more nonsense is equal to coupling terms. You have J minus alpha I is your standard thing. Um, so yes, it's, it's bad and it, get, it can get worse. Um, anyway, you add this extra radiation equation. So Shane and Charles Gammy worked this out in the paper. There's actually hints of this even in Michalis and Michalis and so on. Um, and basically, you're evolving I, which is the intensity of the radiation field at every point in space, at every point in time, in every direction and possibly at every frequency. So it's this you know, six dimensional evolution of this quantity, but here's the equations for it. And the equations look like the equations we're already solving. Um, yes. So good question, the A index, how does that differ from A in Greek? Yes, so, so my, my A is indexing over angles, my Greek letters are indexing over space time. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can sit down and show you know, like the, there's, That's great. there's That's great stuff in these equations. Well, anyway, you, you write this extra equation in the same form we already know how to solve, add a coupling term, you hide everything in general relativistic notation, but don't worry, we can take care of that in the code. Um, and actually, this accounts for you know, everything that radiation should be doing properly. So I took this bottom equation here, and I just expand that, those covariant derivatives in terms of partial derivatives, where we get the evolution of coefficients times the quantity we're talking about is given by a spatial transport term, a curvilinear source term, this appears you know, even if you're working spherical coordinates. You know, angular transport, that's you know, if radiation is going in some direction in one cell, when it enters the next cell of your simulation, gravity has probably bent it in some other direction. That's to be expected. There's a gravitational redshift and there's coupling. So it's all there, and we've written out the equations. And the summary of this is we can actually solve this. It includes scattering as well as absorption. Yes, you can put isotropic scattering is easy, other scattering is a bit more difficult, yeah. Um, so, you know, what does this look like schematically? If I take eight cells of a finite volume simulation in blue, you know, you can think of in each cell, I will have a sphere of angles 
that I'm showing in red, and I've suppressed kind of a, a um, frequency dependence here. And you've just evolved in every direction in the sphere, in every cell, you have a, a quantity, a real number that you're evolving, and those equations that it showed shows how all of this works. Um, you actually have a lot of, you know, with new grids come new choices. And so we have, we play around a lot with angular grids. You could discretize things in kind of a latitude, longitude sort of way, coarse or fine. We've been having a lot of fun actually more with these geodesic grids. Um, and they, you know, you can see they kind of more nicely, more isotropically cover the sphere of angles. So a lot of the simulations we're doing actually use this as well. So I can talk about that afterward as well. Yes. Uh, yes. So we, I think 92 is our standard we run with. Sometimes wow. I run with less, sometimes more. Um, but this is everything I'll show in the last few slides is gray. So we don't have frequency. To, we, we're going to add frequency dependence, but that will just multiply the number of things you're evolving. If you want 10 frequency bins, it will be 10 times the expense. So we might have to scale back on our ambitions with angles when we do that. Um, I'll, I'll just come on a soapbox for a minute here and say, you know, this is very complex and I've glossed over a lot, and we, we do really think this should be tested. If you look at the relativistic radiation hydro literature, um, which applies to a lot of fields, there's a lot of cases where they don't test things as well as you'd like, and you wonder, boy, what if there's a, a factor of two missing somewhere, right? So we do things like colliding beams at different resolutions, which the beams pass through each other, which they, you know, is what they should be doing. We launch beams of light around spinning black holes in the, along the prograde and retrograde photon orbits here, and it goes where it should. Um, we also do these linear wave tests, right, where you, you make small perturbations to a known state, and you evolve the linear equations as so you compare your code to the exact answer, and you should get this kind of you know, second order convergence until it's dominated by coupling, which we do only do at first order, we get first order convergence. So the, the summary is, we spent several years actually testing this code to make sure it's really working um, because it is very complicated. We don't want to, if we're relying on this to interpret our results, you know, it had better be giving the right answer to the PDEs. Uh, what does this all look like? You know, here's density, optical depth per gravitational length, and, you know, a magnetic to radiation pressure ratio. We took a thick disk, you know, a standard test problem that people do without radiation, and we just turned on radiation. Um, and, you know, this is just an example to show, yeah, this all sort of works, um, so we get you know, a nice jet and whatever, but we can also, you know, we also can measure the radiation field. There's a lot of quantities we can get from simulation. I'm just throwing, showing three of them right here. Um, I should say that, yes, this is going to be expensive. Um, all radiation GRMHD is going to be. Uh, and, but well, it's the right time to start tackling this problem. So we've added this to uh, Athena++. Plus Plus. It says all of this code is actually public. Um, Athena K is a new GPU rewrite of uh, parts of Athena++ designed for exascale computing. So this is using the Cocos library, if anyone knows about it, to work on GPUs from any manufacturer. Um, this is, there will be some announcement in the near future about releasing this as well. Um, but just to give an example, now we can run on CPUs or GPUs and, you know, take a CPU node or a GPU, right? You get something like a few million updates per second when using something like 100 radiation angles. Um, so this is actually, this is the point where you can start doing 3D simulations with these rates. And these rates aren't all that different. You know, people like to say GPUs are much faster than CPUs, but you know, computation per dollar, it's all made on the same silicon. It's all pretty comparable. It's just, you know, the Department of Energy has bought an enormous number of GPUs and they're desperate for people to, with, you know, codes that can use that time to actually get science out of it. So if you want to use the biggest machines on earth, you have to have a code that works on GPUs, which is why we moved in that direction. And I'll just say, you know, the nice thing is we're doing relativity here, so we don't worry about the fact that the speed of light is really high. Um, all of our stuff is local simulation, so like every cell operates independently. There's no global uh, matrix inversion or anything like that. So it scales great. Um, this goes out now to 2,000 GPUs. We get 97% scaling. We actually take it out to like five or 6,000 now. It works just fine, which is what you'd expect for these sorts of things. Um, Sorry, I understand why you say local and local. What if it's very optically thin? Uh, it's, so the method we're using is still local in that we transport light one cell at a time because we're limited by this, the light crossing time of a cell already. Mm -hmm. Their sphere felt condition is just useful light. You're using speed of light? Yes, because the gas is already so moving closer. how many dynamical time can you integrate it? If you want billions, the answer is no. We can't. Oh, right. Yeah. So, Give me a number or so. Um, 
So I think more in terms of where do we reach steady state up to like 100 RG in a lot of cases. And that's kind of our goal, maybe 50, maybe 200. So all the tens of dynamical terms? Um, at that radius, yeah. And then like it'll be tens of thousands near the horizon. But yeah, that's that's our limited. But we were already limited. The fluid and the sound speeds were already so close to the speed of light anyway. So the radiation didn't slow things down in that respect. Um, it just slowed things down by having more numbers to compute. I about a ten. Yeah, um, I didn't include a plot here. Yeah, it is about say a, a factor of you know five to twenty is the cost of going from an MHD simulation to a, a radiation MHD simulation for us. Um, and that's, and again, if you want to do like 10 frequency bins, okay, that'll be a lot more, but you know, on, on these machines, the biggest machine is frontier now, and they prefer you to use 50,000 GPUs simultaneously. Um, so they're begging for hard problems that scale well in this hardware. Um, and I'll just, uh, conclude with showing just, this is kind of fresh off of, uh, one of these GPU clusters, some early results. Um, this is the sort of thing we're doing now, or I'm doing is I'm, Combining kind of everything I've talked about now, and said, what about a tilted disk around a spinning black hole where the accretion rates are high enough and the densities are high enough that it's radiatively efficient? So there's radiation in the simulation. Um, and so here you get the disk naturally collapses to a thin disk self consistently. Uh, and you get, as it's coming in from 45 degrees, it then starts to align near the spinning black hole. That's the Bardeen Pedersen effect which we expect. Um, so it's density, here's temperature. I can also show kind of optical depth per gravitational length and uh, radial flux of radiation on the right. Um, so it's the same simulation. And I have a, a bunch of these running now at different uh, different inclinations and so on. And the real trick is actually just... What, what are those straight line features? Yeah, what are the straight line features? So this, this I think, is this is ray effects. So something about our method is uh, because we're not doing like ray casting, we're That's not... about the grid. Yeah, it's about the grid. So and the finite number of angles we have. Right. So this method is really great for not too far away. If you were trying to track like how does a star affect the ISM very far away, um, radiation methods are very difficult in that regime because if I only have a hundred angles of light, it'll look like I have a hundred light beams he heading out from the star instead of a uniform sphere. Well, people usually, well, like Monte Carlo, you split the beams to go out. Right. Could you do the similar thing? Because it is an AMR. We have grid. we have talked about being AMR in angle as well. Uh, we have not implemented that. Right. Uh, but there is there is that possibility, yes. Right. So more resolution can get rid of that. I think a lot of that though is that's streaming away in the optically thin region, so I'm less worried about it. But you're right, it's something we want to improve as well. Yes. Um, sorry, I think you already said this, but I missed it. We went through like the different radiation types, but which type is this? Is that M1 or is that Monte Carlo? Yeah, no, so this is the new finite volume radiation. Okay. So we M1 and Monte Carlo where other people are doing, and this is our own take on everything. Um, the, the yes, so there are I, so there are many dozens of angles, and every cell in the simulation has I have intensity in dozens of interactions, which is almost impossible to plot in any coherent way. Um, but it is it is that expensive method that we're showing. I think ultimately we do want to actually compare the methods, like in a an apples to apples comparison. I think that'd be very valuable for the community as well. So this looks like really great for this break. Yes, are that is. Seeing, are you seeing this? Break? I mean, I could turn the question around to, are you seeing disc breaking? <laughs> uh, it looked like there was a sudden deviation from the disc. I would not try to, because sometimes you see these rings, you know, so the SPH simulations that are differentially processing, right? Yes, and I don't quite see that. I should say this is, it's hard to see in a 2D slice, as opposed to like you looking at 3D renderings. And also look at the, the time here. I've actually only grabbed data up to 6,000 gravitational times, so this needs to run longer. I would say. Yeah. But yeah, my goal is to actually look at disc breaking. And here, you know, radiation to gas pressure is actually a large number. And so you worry, like, as opposed to optically thin cooling when you see disc breaking, what happens now if okay. this disc is illuminating itself and the radiation pressure is like trying to blast out that part, right? Does it make it easier for disc breaking? Maybe it does. Um, well, so we'll, I would have thought that you had a long enough that if there were disc breaking, clear disc breaking, you would have seen it. So it's, it looks like an interesting result. Yes, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I will. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if I run this to twenty thousand gravitational times, and it, 
is not like a separate ring or something that's saying something very interesting. Yeah. Um, but again, there's also all these knobs you can tune, like what is the mass, what is the m dot of this simulation? If I had gone a factor of 10 lower or higher, would that have changed things as well? Um, so was this 50,000 GPUs you said? This, this one was run on 918 GPUs. Oh, only a thousand. Yeah. And how many, what was the wall time? To get to this far, it was something like a day. Okay. Um, yeah. Which I think it, it's, it's expensive, but tractable given the machines that exist exactly. now. Um, yeah, so I'll just conclude and say, you know, Black hole accretion, there's a lot of complexities that I've glossed over, but I want to emphasize that we're making progress and that there's no insurmountable obstacles to really understanding these in detail. Um, and all you have to do is kind of choose for any given question you're asking, what physics are we going to include in the simulation that's going to affect things and make sure we get all the physics that's necessary. Try not to waste time on the <laughs> physics that's not. Um, and I want to emphasize too that you know, tilt is a really important parameter. It can really change the dynamics of these systems when you're close to a black hole. Um, and we'll see, you know, there'll be a lot of interesting data to come from the Galactic Center um, in the next few years. And also, um, you know, if there's already great data for X-ray binaries, and so on, uh, that are these radiation dominated systems. I think now the theory is really going to have to start to catch up to those systems. Uh, so I'll leave it there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So, what, are there any questions in the room? Well, maybe students are close up. I have a couple in that space. First, thank you. This is really fun. Um, so, my first question is about the can you tell the difference between like a black hole that has zero spin and just like a regular fission disk and a black hole that like do you know what like a black hole that doesn't have spin and a fission disk or a black hole that has spin and a fission disk that's like anything zero degrees? Um I think so. I think it, it depends, I guess, which black holes you're looking at. So for um I mean one thing you get when you have spinning, when you have tilted systems. Usually, there's some sort of precession time scale that's in induced in there, and so people invoke this to explain, you know, quasi-periodic oscillations and X-ray binaries and so on. So, like, um, you know, if you have misalignment and spin, you get extra time scales in whatever it is you're observing. And I think that's a pretty telltale sign of there being something else there that something at least that's spinning. Um, and there's other subtle effects as well. So I think the answer is generally yes, uh, but you have to, in any system, you have to tease out what it is you're looking at in, in detail. Another question is if you had like a 90 degree tilt, because you said that the jets want to follow the spin of the black hole and then they turn towards, what if you had like a 90 degree tilt, then would it blow away the accretion disk or would it get like, what would happen? Um, I have some that it kind of just, the, the jet gets interrupted, um, but I think, I imagine if you really wanted to destroy the disk, you could come up with a set of parameters that did that. So there's, you know, there's a lot of freedom in the, your initial conditions. Um, but yeah, I think so. I do. I didn't show any. I've I have like suites of simulations, and sometimes you know you do reasonable things, and then you'll do one ninety degree, maybe for fun, maybe just to see how extreme it gets. Uh, but those are usually a, a lot messier than anything else. So, for the broader question, how converge are the simulations of hyper accretion onto the black holes? I mean, there's the question of how much mass gets in and what the radiation pattern is and so on. Um, boy, when you ask about convergence of these things, it's always a, it's well, a delicate question. Um, yeah. I mean, has the technology matured enough that just with enough, you know, persistence of just sampling, one can solve the problem with that? Cautiously, I'd say yes. Um, the, the resources available are actually quite astounding compared to you know, 10 years ago. So there's a lot we can do. I think, honestly, for most of the stuff I'm thinking of, the limitation is actually just having time and people to analyze this sort of data. Um, but I think that is an approachable thing now. I had a question about your, uh, the, the situation with uh, Sanjay Star. So, you're seeing this different variability, or sorry, you're seeing the different uh, scaling with the time lags when you have a, a self-consistent feeding mechanism. Does that does that just imply that a lot of the simulations that are running with you know arbitrary initial conditions could should be run longer, or is there some 
something fundamentally different about having this, this feeding source that... I think both, I mean, I've run some simulations past you know, 10 to the 5 gravitational times, and other people have as well, and I think a lot of us, we've seen hints that, like scary hints that, oh man, if you run it that long, maybe things do look different, or, or you don't entirely forget your initial conditions even after that time. Um, so that is definitely one possibility, but I think there's also just this sense of, you know, however long you run it, if you started with a nice organized disk, you know, the matter that makes it down to the horizon all follow this one particular path through the disk, and it's not coming off, you know, through the poles or from some other weird angle, and that, but that so might well happen. A shortcut. That's yeah. Uh, okay. Nobody else has a question. Oh, if James. Um, how does your new radiation transport method compare to like a variable Eddington tensor method? Yeah. Uh, so it's. I mean. Like the stuff that like Yanfei and Shane did with the variable names, they actually don't even do that in the Newtonian case anymore. They move on to like the Newtonian analog of what I'm doing. Um, I, so I feel like the, for a lot of problems, this makes sense. But I guess for those who don't know, that's a method where you kind of you do a lot of very complicated follow the light locally, but then you use that to just inform a moment closure, basically. Um, and I think our philosophy has moved toward. As long as you're doing all the work, you may as well track all the angles as well, instead of just trying to close the moments. I think that's worked out well for us so far. Um, like variable Eddington tensor is not, it's hard to see it being more accurate, and it's not really going to be any cheaper than the stuff we're doing. Yeah. And you want to do all the ray tracing, you have the black hole you need. But not... Yeah, uh, though, to be honest, to make images like this highly resolved thing, you have to post process anyway. We can't use the radiation from the simulation because these these ray effects as well will just blur out this image. Um, so even for, we can't actually save ourselves the cost of solar sensitivity. Exactly. Right, this would, this would need a million angles in every zone or something like that. Um, yeah, but at least you're getting the dynamics right. Right, that's, and that's, that's our goal, is to get the dynamics right, so then our post-processing actually so is sensible. Yeah. It would be cool to see a, a GR, like a shadow test, no, because the M1 will fail, Right. right whatever that is. But, um, your method should, should preserve shadows. Yes, and so that like that's our fundamental worry. That's the reason why we're not doing M1. It would, it would be great if we could, and maybe M1 is sufficient. But our worry is a disk is shining from the disk itself, and it's you know the light from the disk. You know, especially if it's lens and it hits the other side of the disk, right? And so you have all these, or if you look in the jet region, you have light from the disk coming in from the the sides. It should pass itself. In M1, it actually gets redirected along the, the jet, right? So is that affecting things? Maybe, maybe not. And I think really the only way to tell is have independent methods like this. Um, so yeah, at some point, you know, the thing is there's no GR radiation code that has multiple radiation methods in it. So you have, it's hard to vary just the radiation scheme, but keep all everything else the same because we've all kind of latched onto our own method. Uh, but at some point we need to coordinate, you know, a better comparison of things. So somebody needs to write an M1 for a theta plus plus. Yes. Um, if there's any students looking for a, exactly. an unrewarding project. <laughs> 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 so, you I have, that, okay, go ahead. Tell me on that. Yes. Hmm. You said M1 for a theta plus plus? Well, the suggestion was that we need to put it in just so we can do an apples to apples comparison in the same code. Yeah, um, so we're, we're actually doing that um, uh, with David oh. Radice. I, I I thought to sort of uh, how do you say this again uh, to to hop on the bandwagon because David Radice is doing um, M one for neutrinos in Athena plus plus so uh, okay. so it's yes. like straightforward to put in photons then. Um, so the I answer have... is David Radice has taken on the work. He's actually already put in a uh, Z four C solver. So he does numerical relativity in Athena now. Um, I thought that was insane to want to add that and it would be really hard but he did it so maybe he will do this as well that's, that's yeah, great beautiful it looks like the amr can really track like two merging stars i, I saw a video it's amazing i have a somewhat simpler question like a lot of people try to measure black hole spins by looking at iron k alpha lines yes you should be able to do that right? yes that is one of our goals um so Taking this, these simulations, especially Shane Davis has wrote um, this Monte Carlo post-processing to really get, like, especially getting like spectral features or these reflection features. So yeah, the question is, you know, does the inner edge of the disk 
look like all these simple semi analytic models. Actually, the answer is no. Uh, right. I mean, it'd be weird if it did, right? That would be great, but um, yes, that is okay, well so can do that. Cool. Yes. We should probably continue the discussion over coffee and cookies upstairs. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, just for the record, Sean says he agrees with everything we said about it. Okay. 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 Okay.